rules for this convening, other than to give you a fabulous time, is to try and give you an understanding of the present state of new intelligences in the museum field and help you imagine the future of where it may go. We're hoping you'll go away having identified key decision points on directions you might want to take and resources. Now that said, what I would like to do is open the formal part of our agenda by acknowledging that this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Seminole people and pay my respect to elders past and present. And as a futurist, I particularly like to ground our work with a look to the past and respect for what's happened. Because when we think forward instead of back, we're basically flipping the work of a historian. Instead of trying to figure out what has happened and what has influenced where we've gotten to this point, we're trying to imagine the consequences of our actions and where they may take us. This is particularly interesting when we're talking about technology. Thank you very much, Chris, for reminding us that it's never really about the technology. It's about the human behavior that underlies the technology. Because technology can be anything. I'm a great fan of this technology. Post-it notes have changed my life. My colleagues mock me for this. And AI is the same way. So I take this for granted now. In 20 years, in 10 years, maybe we'll be taking artificial intelligence tools and our own personal chatbots and personal assistants uh, for granted too. But as we move towards that future, as you said, the important thing to remember isn't just the technology per se and the potential it has for changing our life for the good, but to remember all of the embedded ethical decisions we have to make. And remember that we need to be highly conscious that whatever we build for the future has an unfortunate habit of pulling in all of our unfortunate past history. So how can we try and make the next iteration of technology and power more responsible and more ethical and more responsive to the needs of all our communities? With that introduction, I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker, Kristen Summers, who is the technical delivery lead for Watson Expert and Delivery Services for the public sector for IBM. You probably read, I hope you've read Kristen's formal bio that we included in the meetings material. So I actually wanted uh, to introduce her by telling you how I was interested in tracking her down as a speaker. One of the earliest things I was doing for CFM as I was reading the news and looking for video clips was looking for interesting emerging technologies. Yes, I'm looking at politics and social trends and what's going on in the environment and what's going on in economics, but technology is a very important influence on the future in general and museums in particular. So I was absolutely gobsmacked when I turned on Jeopardy, which is a favorite program of my husband's, and saw that two past champions, Brad Rutter and Ken Jennings, were competing against IBM Watson. This was 2011. And my first thought was, this is going to be funny. And it was, but not in the way I expected, because Watson beat the pants off <laughs> Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter. And I was left going, hmm, this is interesting. I am now putting IBM Watson in my scanning feed, so I will get notifications. And in the following years, I started to notice as IBM Watson began working with uh, doctors to do medical analysis and, uh, and diagnosis. I began watching uh, stories about IBM Watson dabbling in the stock market, which was scary too. <laughs> and as I saw more and more of these applications and began to see how a tool like this could mine masses of data and make it more accessible to people without them knowing specialized programming language, my thought was, I want to see IBM Watson for museums. How come we can't have a personal museum assistant that harnesses those capabilities? So for all of those reasons, I was absolutely thrilled when we apt, uh, finally made contact with Kristen to hear her talking about how IBM and her colleagues are already beginning to work with the public sector and look at applications of these technologies for things we can do to reach the public and improve our own operations. So now I'm pleased to introduce Kristen, who will be talking to us about AI for interaction and understanding. Thank you so much. This is really exciting to me. I work with AI all the time, but I work with AI in a very different environment usually. So I'm gonna talk about some general concepts and some examples from commercial and other kinds of public sector engagements. And I'm gonna share some of my 
thoughts that I hope may help as we talk in more detail later about things that might apply in a museum and more artistic kind of environment. Um, but that's like a really exciting change for me, so I want to acknowledge that and thank you for that opportunity. I'm going to talk first about going from analytics to AI, because I think a lot of people are highly familiar with analytics, and both descriptive and predictive analytics, and kind of what that means to them. And then we talk about AI, and things become perhaps much squishier uh, often in people's minds. And so I want to just talk a little bit about where these things fall on a spectrum and how they relate to each other generally. And then I'm going to talk about AI for a variety of different, more specific purposes. For natural communication, right? We often focus on that. AI can enable kind of interacting, having a conversation, right? That's, that's one of the things that Beth was talking about. Um, and for personalization, to make an experience much more specific to an individual. And then more generali generally, for analyzing and predicting information, which is quite often also what people think about when they think about AI and when they think about machine learning in particular, right? And then I'm going to talk about a few more concrete examples in the sort of really ambitious space, things that people are working on and working towards. And I'll show one live example of that. And then some closer in things where these are capabilities that are there that are perhaps easier to use for new uh, purposes in a more direct and, and quick way. And some of them you could even play with this afternoon if you want to, if you brought your laptop, right? And I'll show one example of that. And then I'd like to have questions and discussion and talk about things. To move from analytics to artificial intelligence, right? First, we think in terms of like descriptive analytics. People usually start there, like, what's in my data? I have a bunch of information. What, what's even there, right? And what kinds of things? What are the trends? Are there outliers? How much variability is there? Are there some naturally occurring clusters? Do you find that it just happens that, you know, you have kind of different maybe sets of people visiting your institution or coming to your website looking for information and maybe young people in Miami are all looking for one kind of information and you know older people in Chicago are looking for another or something right you know do you find that just sort of happening in your data and then you move into predictive analytics right well based on my past data what's likely to happen if i know some things about something what's likely to happen next or i, I want to point this out about the vocabulary People often talk about predictive analytics. We use that word, but we're not always predicting something that's unknown because it's in the future. It may just be some value that we don't know, right? So I may know a lot of things about this individual person, and I don't actually already know which object they might want to buy, right? Or which piece of information is most important to them. And that may be what I'm predicting when I do predictive analytics. So both of those fall into that space where you start to come past just describing what's in your data and looking at, OK, what can I infer on that basis? And what will that tell me? And then, of course, people talk about prescriptive analytics. So quite often, where you want to go with that is, given that I can predict some outcome, or I can try to predict some outcome based on what I know, well, if I change some particular values, can I get a better result? Can I, you know, if I'm predicting how satisfied somebody is going to be with an experience, whether that be shopping or whether that be coming to a location or something, can I say, well, they're more likely to be more satisfied if I change something about it? And what might I do? What might I recommend? Right? So that's kind of the, the continuum that you usually see about analytics, going from descriptive to predictive to prescriptive. So what happens in here when we talk about artificial intelligence? Machine learning is usually the first thing we talk about, right? And that's not the only thing in artificial intelligence, but it's usually the first thing that people think of, and it's also the most direct mapping to these kinds of analytics. So when we do machine learning, what we're doing is essentially that predictive analytics piece, right? We have some, typically, so we have some set of data, and we're trying to say, what can we learn? What patterns can we find? We have these great pattern finding machines, right? And what can that tell us? And both uh, unsupervised machine learning, which is more like what are the naturally occurring clusters, right? It even maybe falls into the descriptive analytics sometimes. It's like, OK, I have all this data. What can I just find out about it? Where can I find patterns and say, this is important? I might not know what it means, but here it is. And then doing the more predictive piece so I have a bunch of examples and I know the outcomes from those examples and I'm going to learn to generalize so when I see something new 
I predict what that unknown outcome is or that unknown piece of information. So machine learning fits right into this spectrum. And then you often use it in order to do the prescriptive analytics, right? You know, if I can learn what affects something and what an outcome is likely to be, then I can make recommendations about what to do. Or I can see which recommendations are in fact likely to be taken and likely to be satisfying. I can learn that too. And then AI kind of encloses all of this, right? Machine learning is a subcategory of artificial intelligence. It's a, you know, a part of the field. It's a set of techniques within this broader field. But artificial intelligence usually implies to us that we're using that in some way that tells us something about, well, what does it mean, right? Or can I make it this much more natural experience? Can I make it feel more like a human is doing something? And so, and artificial intelligence isn't solely patterns that we find in the data. There is also knowledge representation and engineering and understanding about how do we model the things that we care about in the world in order to create something that feels more intelligent-like. And so when we talk about artificial intelligence, at least at IBM, we tend to focus on a few aspects. We focus on the learning, absolutely. We also focus on naturalness. And there's a couple of different kinds of naturalness that we focus on. One is of the data itself, right? So rather than kind of preparing the data very carefully for some kind of analysis by computer, a big piece of what we do in artificial intelligence is saying, we're gonna take the data as we find it, right? If it's text, if it's language, we're gonna operate on that. So the Jeopardy playing system, right? You have all of this information that resides in documents that people write and text that people write down. It's not designed to be comprehensible by a computer. It's not made so that you know, well, this value is gonna be in this field and then if that one is true and that one is true, here's what it means, right? But if you can process that, if you can interpret those patterns, then you can match that up with things that people are asking about and say, oh, here's the part that gives me an answer to this. And here's the piece of this that really seems to be the answer. So that's one kind of naturalness. Another kind of naturalness is of the interaction and the experience for the human, right? So that it feels like a conversation. A lot of people, when they think about AI, they think about that, right? I'm, I'm, having, I'm interacting with a chatbot. I can ask it something. I can say, you know, what hours are the, is the museum open? And it will tell you, right? Or, you know, what is the most popular exhibit, you know, for, you know, I don't know, people like me, people in my age group or in general, right? And that sort of thing. And then also, though, we talk about facilitating new insights, right? Capabilities where the machine can kind of point you and suggest something that's of interest to you and can maybe point you to you as the human might be the one who says this is what it really means. But the machine can help you say, well, here's an interesting pattern. Here's something that's important for what you're doing. And then we also focus on expertise, right? Representing information and the system having some information that you want to know. Right? So it has some area that it knows about. And when you think about the system as a whole, you think about it not just in terms of its processing, but also in terms of its expertise. And so there are a bunch of pieces of that right, that have to do with the learning and the patterns, with the representation of the information, with interpreting things that are unstructured, and with finding insights and making predictions and sort of presenting them as inferences. And this is almost where couple of uh, the previous uh, remarks pointed out, right, that even when it's about technology, it's not really about the technology, it's about the humans. And a lot of these pieces are where that intersects, right, because we're doing this purely technological thing of finding these patterns or trying to map speech to words so that then you can process it. And then there's the question of how you put that together with information that's been represented about the domain, what people care about, how to show it back to them so that the whole experience comes together and represents some kind of intelligence, if we want to call it that, right? So to talk just a little bit more now specifically about AI for the purposes of natural communications, I do want to talk about the Jeopardy system a little bit, right? So that is where uh, IBM Watson started. Uh, it played Jeopardy and won against two champions. And so what was happening here, right? A lot of things were coming together that I just described. A lot of work in language processing to pull information that is often sort of 
buried from automatic computation if you don't use language processing. It's sort of information that's scattered around a bunch of documents that's written somewhere on the internet. You know, it's almost every, any fact you might want is somewhere out there, right? But pulling all of that together and then processing it so that you can make sense of it enough that then when there's a question, you can say, well, okay, what is this question really asking about? What is the topic? What is it looking for? Where might I find that? You know, sort of at a course level, where in all this information? Is it in these textual documents? It, is it in some databases and repositories of information I have? Do I have to combine that and say, well, I know something that limits where I'm looking in the text from my structured information. I know we're talking about this particular geography or time period, but then I have to go up find the particular fact in textual information. And then go match up the sentences in those documents, the particular things they're saying, with exactly what's being asked about in that question, find things that could be the answer, and then score. How likely are they to be the answer? And one thing I want to point out about this is that's not saying how likely it is to be true in some objective sense, right? The machine had no sense of that. It's how likely is it that this thing is being stated as the answer to this question? And the truth value of it comes entirely from the data being pulled into the system in the first place, right? If you're gonna make a decision about that, it was at that point. Except that it was likely to believe is more likely things that are stated more frequently, right? So if you have something, you have lots of sources that say that something's true, that's more likely to really be your answer. So that's going on with the Watson Jeopardy system. And it pulled together a lot of those pieces and kind of pushed things forward. But it's, it's one aspect of natural communications and one aspect of what we're doing at IBM with AI, right? So if we look at this in kind of a general picture, there are a lot of other things that we do. So conversational interactions, we've been talking about that. Chatbots, right, are sort of the first thing we think about about making it natural. So that rather than doing like a database query or a search, you're actually having an ongoing interaction where you articulate something, the machine responds, you articulate something, the machine responds. So what's going on there, right, is it has to recognize what it is that you're saying. What is the core fact, the core intent of what you're saying when you put something in? And then go find what is the right way to respond to that. And there are a lot of different levels of things that can be behind what is the right way to respond to that, right? In some cases, it's like, oh, I have a few things I know how to recognize, and I know exactly what to say in response. In other cases, it's like, well, I have to go look up that information, or I have to go find something that seems to match it. Then speech. So the next step in making things natural is like, I don't have to type into that chatbot, right? I speak to my computer. We're almost starting to take that for granted, but it's definitely still an AI area and definitely something where there's ongoing research. And speech has two directions, right? So it needs to understand the words that you're saying and generate speech in response, right? So we have both speech to text, which then gives you text that then that conversational interaction piece, the chatbot or assistant is processing. And then the other direction, it finds a response. And then we have to generate the speech from that and try to make it sound natural. What that can lead to at that point then is avatars, right? Then add a face to it. And in some cases, you have people making extremely realistic, modeled on human beings, faces that kind of express both the language and the emotion and respond to the person that they're interacting with. So that's one sort of one category of naturalness is just the feel of the interaction. And those are sort of points along that spectrum. But another is, well, what's being said in the first place, right? What's behind that? And so one piece of making things natural for people is putting it in their language, right? So a big area of artificial intelligence is machine translation. To what extent can you automate translating from one language to another? And this is a field that's been, been going on for a long time. And a great way to use it often is as a starting point. So I'm sure we all have experiences with machine translation, right? And we've all seen things that, you know, come with a little disclaimer, this was out of been translated by machine, and you're like, mm, most of this makes sense, but it's a little odd, right? A very common great way to use it is you start with the machine translation and someone post-edits it if you really want a natural seeming translation. So you've taken the burden of doing the kind of rote translation that's very direct and comparatively straightforward for a person, you've taken that burden off the person. But they're still putting things in that make it right. The other thing just to note about machine translation, and this is true for really almost all of these categories, all of them really, is that there's customization for any particular domain that you want, right? So if you need to translate something that's highly technical or has a lot of jargon or has a lot of slang, 
the system's going to need to learn about that. <laughs> um, and there are a few different ways to do that. So for some cases, you may want, you, you just need to tell it certain vocabulary, right? Here are words, and here's how they're translated, and here's what part of speech they are, and here's what they mean. In other cases, you need to train a statistical part, right? Give it examples of input and output, and it learns that. And then typically, machine translation systems also have a part that's purely about modeling the output language, the target language, in order to make it sound more natural. So when we talk about machine translation, we typically talk about both adequacy and fluency. Right? Adequacy is did you get the meaning across, right? Can people tell what the facts are in this information? Fluency is does it sound like what someone would say in the target language? And those are often different, and we actually have different models typically um, in, that the machine learns in order to do those things. And so when we think about customizing machine translation for particular purposes and for particular domains, both of those are a part of it. And so that's an additional kind of naturalness. And then we have things like sentiment and emotion. So can your assistant or uh, that you're interacting with or something that's trying to translate, can it recognize when you're expressing a particular kind of feeling and respond or express that appropriately, right? So if you're really having a natural interaction with some kind of a chatbot and you say you're miserable about something, you want it to respond in a way that recognizes that, right? Or if you're really excited about something, it should maybe follow up on that, like that was a good thing. And, and it indicates what kind of thing you like or are interested in. And so that's another piece that can fall into several categories, actually, because people also often use it for like tracking trends, right? But it's part of making things really feel natural when you interact as well. And then those are the things we typically talk about when we talk about natural communications. But there's this other element, which is like, and what are we conversing about, right? There's an enormous piece of this that is representing some kind of knowledge, some kind of that, what is the response going to be? Right? And so that can vary tremendously. It can vary from I have a chatbot to express things that are basically in frequently asked questions, and I know certain things people are going to ask, and I'm going to recognize different ways of expressing them, and then give a precise response that's predetermined for each of them, to things where you know, you're going and trying to really look something up and make some kind of inference in order to respond. Right? And when we look at something, you know, at some of these sort of natural feeling things, any degree along that spectrum could be behind it, right? And it really depends on the purpose. So that's kind of the natural communications. Another way of looking at AI is in terms of personalization, right? So who is the individual? Well, from the point of view of the system, I mean, it's, an individual is much more than this. But from the point of view of a system that's trying to personalize and give responses that are specific to that individual, there are a lot of ways you might get that information, right? You, you person might have a profile. There might be just facts you know about them, demographics, their stated interests, whatever you may know. And then you've got some history, right? And there are direct activities, maybe prior interactions with your system. This is very common, right? What kinds of products are you interested in? Well, what did you buy from us before? What kinds of events do you want to go to? What kinds of events did you go to before, right? But there are also kind of indirect indications in somebody's historical information, if that's available to you. What things did they talk about? What things did they react to well, right? What did they post on social media? We were just talking about tweeting about this event on social media, right? What kinds of things did they say are interesting to them, or how did they react to things? So all of those can go into what might you want to personalize. And when you're interpreting those direct activities and those indirect indications, there's often a fair amount of AI in there, or there can be, right? So what are the patterns and things people have done? Interpret their language and things that they've said. What are the pa And then what are the patterns in that? So you're pulling like multiple pieces together there. And then there's also a piece of this about recognizing who the person is. That may not be AI. You may just have logged in. But it may be AI if it's, say, recognizing your face, right? Or recognizing you from you know, user behaviors or something like that. So then there's also some information you can use to personalize that's not sort of the long-term model of the person, but it's within the interaction, right? So what are you responding to? You want to kind of react to like, did I like it? Did I not like it? You want to react in the moment and respond to that. And then again, the sentiment and emotion, right? Did I, did I respond in a way that sounds positive? Am I, you know, reacting negatively to something or not liking it?
And then we often also have, when you pull that together, now you have a notion of what this person is about, what they're interested in, what they're doing. And then we have these aggregate models, right? Because some of these things that might be in your profile or in your history, they might not tell you directly what somebody is interested in, but you might know something about people like them. So this is, again, an experience we kind of all have in shopping, right? People who liked this also liked that, you know? But this can be much more general. People who, you know, express a lot of interest in this kind of thing or express themselves in a particular way. People who get very excited and maybe are impulsive tend to like this kind of thing, right? So you can do those kinds of interpretations as well. And then you might express that back in a system in a wide variety of ways. So you can do it in like a chat pod and the way it talks, right? Also, it might just be as simple as like personalizing the interaction. I know who you are. I know when to bring in, you know, what you did last or what you seem to be interested in. Obvious one that we all experience is recommendations, not just things to buy, but maybe things to do, right? You know, what kinds of activities might you like? And also content. So this is very common as well, right? If you're doing a search or if you're asking a question about information in a system, well, which things might you be most interested in? The search is often really underspecified, right? Maybe just a few words. But if the system has a lot of context about, do you like new things? Do you, are you using a potentially ambiguous word? Are you more likely to be using it about art or technology? Or you know, if I'm asking about Apple, am I asking about food or am I asking about the computer company, right? It, it can be that simple. Um, but also, more generally, even once I've resolved that, you know, am I likely to want to hear about new things, popular things, things that are unusual? You can start to kind of tease out those differences and make much more specific recommendations of what to look at. You know, oh, here's an article that people are just starting to read, right? Or you tend to like things, you know, that are that give me sort of a full historical context. So here's a set of things together, all of those kinds of things you can start to do. And then you can also start to look at like the styling of the response. You know, are you someone who's likely to respond well to a much more casual interaction that's like friendly and warm? Do you want something much more businesslike and crisp, right? I think we've all had the experience of uh, companies estimating that uh, about us in ways that uh, aren't what we would prefer, right? So <laughs> it's nice if you can kind of customize and tailor that to individuals. And then also we talk about analyzing and predicting, right? And this is extremely general. Analyze anything, predict anything, right? You can, if you can express something as a bunch of features and data points to put into a model, you can do something with it. You can see whether you can learn something, whether there are patterns. But there are specific categories that we quite often look at, right? So language I've been talking about a lot because that underlies both our roots in uh, you know, the Jeopardy playing system and IBM, and also a lot of the chatbot technology and the things that people kind of tend to think about with AI. I, I want to pause and make one comment about that. You know, Beth noted that maybe eventually we'll take AI for granted. We kind of already do. So OCR, um, optical character recognition, when you scan in a piece of paper and you get back, here's what the computer thinks the text is that was on that paper. That, that uses machine learning. That was AI. People tend, don't tend to think about it as AI anymore because it's become commoditized. And speech and chatbots, we're, we're probably not there yet. We still think about them as AI, but it's, it's coming, right? So language is a huge piece of this, and it, and it shows in that way. And images, too, right? Images are also data that's not specifically structured for the computer to know how to interpret it. And so to look at an image and say, oh, I think that's a plant. I think those are leaves. I think that's so-and-so's face. Even I think that is a face, right? All of those things really require pretty heavy AI in many cases. And often you have to think pretty carefully about what it is that you want to recognize, what kinds of things about the image are important to you, and train for that. So, you know, we have a, um, an API at IBM that we offer publicly that will give you both things like certain kinds of objects that you might care about and also some general characteristics of the image, like this is predominantly green, right? Because for some purposes, you might care more about that and you might use that to sort of cluster data and look at color and maybe texture and things like that. Those are categories. Uh, also, interpreting plans and actions. And this is something where quite often there's a heavy piece 
uh, both in kind of representing the world and understanding what things are possible, as well as finding naturally occurring patterns. So, you know, what things might people do in sequence? Um, and you might find things that are like, oh, this person seems to be getting ready to uh, buy tickets to a movie. Are they going to get all the way there? What might make a difference for that, right? And then predicting events, you know, so is something likely to happen? And a uh, project that I worked on a while back was about uh, using social media to try to predict a variety of kinds of events and both do prediction and do early detection for different events in that category. So some were about trying to recognize when there was likely to be social unrest. So at what point as people are kind of talking, is it reaching the point where people are actually going to like go out and do something, right? And then another part was about disease. When do you see like, oh, you know, it looks like this disease is really starting to spread. And those are very different things in terms of the particular indicators you would look for, but they're both things where what you're looking for is a pattern and a sequence where something kind of pushes past a threshold, right? So we, we, we look for those kinds of things in order to predict events and how likely they are. And then categorizing and routing information is a huge area, right? So just finding like, you know, if you have inquiries to a customer service center, well, which ones are about something that should go to people who are experts in this versus about something else that should go into experts in something else? And once you're doing that, you can start to kind of infer some organization in your information. You can start to say, well, you know, there's a lot of, th there are some naturally occurring categories. There's some categories that I care about. Do they match with each other? Are some more broad and some are subsets of each other? Are they related? Which things tend to correlate? And to start to sort of pull together a graph, oftentimes of information that otherwise is so scattered around, people can't quite get their arms around it. And quite often the way that plays out is it's kind of semi-automated, right? The, the machine is going to suggest some things. And you might look at it and say, well, this one makes sense to me and that one doesn't. But these are the kinds of things that we do in analyzing and predicting, and it can be almost anything, right? So people have tried things like the stock market, um, absolutely. I wouldn't put money in that personally, but you know, it's definitely a thing people have tried. Um, and then there's another piece to this. I tend to talk about analyzing and predicting. There's also generation, right? You can generate language. You can generate images. There have been a few articles in the paper in the last few months about AI-generated visual art. And quite often what that sort of thing is based on, I, I don't know those particular projects, but what that sort of thing is based on is predicting what is likely. So you have this model, this predictive model that says, well, if I have this, then this other thing is likely. If I have these pixels here, these pixels are likely to be these colors. Or if I have this kind of object here, I'm likely to have this kind of object there. And then you find some ways of starting and predict from there, right? And you can generate things. And that can be true also in terms of next steps in planning, right? So language, images, things that are happening in the world, all of those, that generation is actually almost a flip side to the prediction task. So now I want to talk about some examples. And I want to start with some things that are really sort of ambitious places that people have been looking at these kinds of things. And I'm going to give one live demo, well, not live demo, I'm going to show one video of what we call a digital human. This is something where partner, oh, let me just pause that, yep. So IBM and a partner, well, the partner has what they call a digital human, and it's IBM who is driving the conversation, so understanding and response. And it is a very realistic, as you'll see, avatar that Soul Machines has put together that can interact with you. And really, it's sort of at the far end of the naturalness category, right? What is this really, you know, how can you really make it feel like you're talking to a human being? So I'm going to skip a bunch of the introduction and just show you what it's like when the avatar talks. Good morning. Hi there. I'm Rachel. Hi, Rachel. I'm Sean's new. How's it going? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. This is my first time in New York City. Really? Where are you from? Um, have you ever heard of a place called the Internet? <laughs> yeah, I guess I spent some time there. Well, I've lived there all my life. I'm a creation of soul machines. I can see you and hear you. And what makes me different is that I can respond to your emotions. I guess you could say I'm putting a human face on artificial intelligence. 
Wow. So what brings you here? I am working with IBM Watson to deliver knowledge across a vast range of topics. My current interest is helping people find the best credit card for them. Really? <laughs> I've actually been looking into credit cards recently. What a coincidence. <laughs> really? Yeah, but it's really overwhelming. You know, there's so many credit cards out there, so many offers, options. I don't really know what to do. Oh, Shantanu, I completely understand. It can be a lot to figure out. Would you like some help? Sure. Um, I'm looking for a card with no annual fee, a low APR, and something where I can get the maximum amount of points. Okay. So you're looking for a points card. I can definitely help. All right, so then she helps him find a credit card. She asks him his credit score, he says it in front of everybody, and she helps him find a card. <laughs> um, but I want you to see, like, that's a super realistic, right? She's, it's not just that her lips are synced with her face, but her, her whole face moves as she talks. She responds. There's a bunch of parts of that that are sort of knowing how to chit-chat, right? She says hi. She says, oh, I understand. She's showing empathy. And then there's a bunch of parts of it that are actually going and looking up, OK, once he gives me specific information and tells me what kind of card he's looking for and what his credit score is, and she asks him whether he carries a balance, looking up what is the particular piece of information he needs. And all of that kind of comes together behind the scenes. And what people tend to see and react to, right, is you have this incredibly realistic face. And she's talking to you, and you can talk to her about Anything within her domain of expertise, which in this instance is credit cards, right? <laughs> that is one way where people are really kind of pushing uh, the boundaries. Is this the most recent iteration of this? No. There are more recent iterations. That's one that's out publicly. That was actually from 2017. There have been some advances. And it sounds like maybe you've seen them. Um, and. Yeah, absolutely. It is always advancing and always changing. That one I like to show because A, it was public, and B, it's a very, you know, sort of smooth interaction and presentation. It's easy to show a little clip and kind of see various aspects of it. There are also other faces, right? That's one that we work with with soul machines and that we can show, but they have, you know, they can make a custom one, they have other faces, avatars. Uh, by the way, that is based on one of their employees. It's modeled on a real person, which is why it looks so realistic. It's interesting because it, it, it reminds me of the very creepy interaction I had on um, with a voice that it wasn't until I got about a minute and a half into the interaction until I realized that it was not a person. Yeah. And I said, am I talking to a human being? And there was dead silence. This <laughs> 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 saying, it feels like a, a, a very impressive but very early iteration. <clears throat> That's what this looks like. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it is always, I mean, this is definitely people reaching at the edges. And so it's always changing and expanding. Um, yeah, and it's usually a good idea to put into the specifically learned chit chat. Um, I am, you know, a creation of the internet, or I am, you know, <laughs> the answer to the question: Am I speaking with a human? And let it tell you that no, you're not. <laughs> um, absolutely. So that, and and what we've been calling that is a digital human to distinguish it from like cartoon avatars and things like that, right? Because it's much more specifically modeled. So that's one category of kind of really pushing far. Another is advice in emergency situations. So this is something that we have been working on in you know, small bits at a time with NASA to give advice to pilots in emergency situations. So when something goes wrong and it's something you can sort of look up immediately, then great. But when something goes wrong and you don't know exactly what happened, Every second counts, and you don't want to be thinking about, well, you know, how am I supposed to search for this information? What am I supposed to say? So the starting point there was actually came from the, the underpinnings of the question answering system. Process all this information that's in manuals. Process information that's in reports of past events. Try to figure out where you can pull the things that are relevant. There are a lot of pieces that 
have to be added to that, right? And this is still very much ongoing, one piece at a time. What is the context, right? You don't want to force the person to say, well, it's raining outside right now, and I have this, and I have that, right? You need to sort of pull that from sensors and where it's known, and then pull it into how you're looking up the information in the most effective way. It needs the speech interface, right? People can't be typing and looking away. You know, that's super important. And it needs to be streamlined. Every second counts. Every, you know, they're going to be trying to do other things and solve the problem at the same time, right? So all of those pieces are hugely significant parts of this. But this is a direction where all of these things can come together and all of them really matter, right? Even the things that might feel like the naturalness often feels like, well, that's kind of for fun. But if you're in a situation where somebody's cognitive load is really, really high, it becomes very important that that interaction be natural and that not be adding to that cognitive load. So that's an area that, that I think is really interesting that's also kind of really pushing the edges of how, how all these things can be used. And then there's another one that people often work on that uh, kind of, I guess, uh, has some relation to this event or to, or to your work as a futurist, right? Which is predicting emerging technologies, right? What's really going to take hold? What's real? What's likely to take off? When is that inflection point going to come? Those are really hard questions to answer. And that is something that people look at in terms of, well, can we figure out what are the characteristics of things where this has happened before? And where is there some kind of convergence or starting to be some convergence around a technology, around an approach, around results that are promising beyond the kind of initial glimmers of what's promising? And how far back can you track that, right? And these are really kind of big open questions. It's something that people work on. It's also an interesting example to me of the ways that a lot of these things can be done along a spectrum, right? So we had a recent project where we talked about, uh, we looked at finding, sort of helping you to understand an emerging technology you've also rec you've already recognized, right? So looking at it in terms of processing, reporting about something and trying to say, oh, well, here's a bunch of products people are mentioning. And here's a bunch of high-level concepts people are mentioning. And which ones do people mention together? And that kind of thing. So you can kind of get a feel for what's going on. And that's at the sort of more direct application of what we can do today, end of the spectrum. And then you get all the way out to, well, you know, can we infer from sort of early research papers, what are the underlying things that are really similar and say that's what's likely to come together and really become an emerging technology that may not even be named yet or that may not even be, you know, uh, brought together as a single thing. And there's, of course, everything in between. So these are kind of, you know, all of these are sort of out there visions that, that use all these capabilities but really try to press them to the limit. And my thought about that, and I think you, you mentioned this also, it's like, well, what does that mean in sort of a more artistic and museum kind of context? Is the analogous thing like a really deeply personalized tour? And the reason I put it that way is I think personalization of an interaction experience falls is very much the kind of thing that could fall along a huge spectrum, right? But if you had something where you could be chatting about your interests in general and what you're responding to in different exhibits, then it could tell you, oh, you might then want to know more about this aspect or this history, or you might like this other one, not because it's similar on the surface, but because it has some underlying characteristics that are the same. Like that would really, I think, have this same kind of flavor, right? And really kind of be pushing it that way. And then to, to kind of pull back and say, okay, but what are things that we do today? right? And how do they work? There are a bunch of things that we do today that also, I think, have analogies in this space. So one very direct one is to track social media sentiment or sentiment in news and social media, I should say, right? So what do people like? What do they react to? And there are a bunch of pieces of that. Some of it's the direct sentiment, you know, what's positive, what's negative, generalizing from that to emotion, what kind of positivity, you know, is it like excitement? Is it contentment? or you know, what kind of negativity? Are people sad? Are they angry? Whatever. Are they confused, right? All of those things. And then also, what is that directed at, right? Is it you know, a particular entity? Is it you know, something that they saw? Is it you know, a product, a company in, the, in this space? Is it a particular exhibit? Is it the museum itself? You know, what are people talking about? And what's getting that attention? Is the 
emotion and the sentiment, positive, negative, or mixed, you don't typically want to average it, right? Because something might have a lot of positive and a lot of negative, and that's quite different from having a very sort of middle, stable kind of response. Um, and we see both of those things in different things that we track. And then how much of it is there, right? Is there a lot of it? Is there a little? Is it something that's attracting attention? So this is running on about two months worth of news and blog kind of data that it pulls. And this is here, you can play with it. Um, it uses a bunch of the underlying Watson analysis of the text to find things like sentiment, topics, keywords. This question that it starts with kind of implies that you should be looking for a company, but you can put in whatever you want. It doesn't have to literally be a company. Does, does it know to get tired of the news like we do? <laughs> <laughs> no, so one of the things about a machine is it does not get tired. It just keeps looking at it. And if the keywords are the same, it will tell you it's the same keywords over and over. But it will show you a graph that will show you there are no outliers and you can interpret that as boredom if you want. <laughs> um, so it'll show you things like here are some top stories. Here are some top entities that are mentioned in combination with this. So here are stories that it's had recently. Here are entities. You can see topics, what topics are mentioned with it, people, individual names that are mentioned that it thinks are names of people, right? So um, companies that are mentioned together, organizations. Um, and you can see it's, it's recognized that PAM is an acronym for something that's an organization. It hasn't recognized it's the same as the museum, right? So you can kind of see how those things work. And then it will show you sentiment. So lots of positive sentiment and a little bit of negative. So that was great. I checked that before showing it. <laughs> and you can see from different sources where you're getting the positive and negative sentiment, right? So you can see kind of, well, where is this coming from? Is the predominance different in different places? You can look for anomalies. Is there an unusually high number of mentions of this at a certain time? So you can kind of track, like, where is the interest coming? If you correlated that with events, I bet it would correlate pretty well, right? You probably would not be surprising, but it would be interesting to see, right? And then you can see co-mentions. What is it mentioned together with? And how often does that happen? And what kinds of, how much sentiment are you seeing around that? And so you can really kind of get a feel of what's going on around something that you're querying. And of course, if you build out from the underlying capabilities, you can structure this differently and look for all kinds of different other trends. But this is showing, you know, something that's already there that you can play with. And you can get to this and also the underlying APIs that it uses at www.ibm.com slash Watson and then browse from there through the different offerings if you want to sort of back up from this specific thing. All right. So having done that, what are some other things, right, that are kind of like things we do today that have some direct analogy? So interactive assistance, chatbots, assistance, things that respond to sort of known areas of interest and either give you responses that it knows are the response for that thing or looks them up like we did with the credit card or, you know, goes and does a search when it doesn't know for sure and says, well, here's text that looks like it should be the answer. Those are very common. And there's a sort of natural, I think, affinity for, with that with a kind of starting point for a custom or personalized tour or experience of something, right? You can do it at the level of frequently asked questions about the uh, institution as well, right? So when is it open? When did it start? What is its background? We often find that even when people start with a chatbot that is about doing some particular task or having some particular experience, they also, people also end up wanting to put in some of that kind of historical information because people wind up asking, you know, but what is this thing that I'm, you know, asking about. So that, and that can be either text, chat, or speech, right? So you can also make it more neutral that way. Clustering information is another one. So that's something that comes up a lot, especially in text, but it can also be sort of structured data, especially if you don't know a lot about the structure. You maybe have a lot of fields, but maybe the format's really old and you don't really know what they all represent, but you want to see, well, are there some naturally occurring groupings that I then might look at together and either show people together or understand myself, right? That this is something that I want to make some decision about. And so I understand that museums have growing digital collections, right? And archives of information about collections that aren't digital. And maybe some of these things could help cluster and sort of provide some starting points for either organization or for sort of a, a person's experience looking at them and saying, well, these other things are similar, right? Based on the archives we have about them or something. So you might be interested in them as well. 
And so there might be sort of two ways of looking at that, one being within a collection, you're looking at this item, here are other similar items, and the, then the other, stretching it a little farther, would be across collections to be like, hey, there's a bunch of stuff in this collection that looks similar to the things in that one, so if you like that one, you might like this one, or you might want to handle them in some related way. And then, I'm not sure this is quite as close in, but I think it uh, could be an interesting question is, if we find sort of implicit similarities or even blank space, right? If you're looking for things like, well, I'm not saying it's similar because the content is precisely similar, but are there some visual aspects that are similar in things or in some kind of other more digital unstructured data, just the values without quite knowing what they mean seem to be similar. Can we group those together and maybe find, well, there's you know clusters of groups that have some things in common and then things that don't seem to exist. There's nothing with this set of features, but not that set of features. That might be an interesting thing for people to know and look at. Those were kind of some sample thoughts about things that might be sort of mostly more direct applications of things that are sort of easy to interact with, that don't require as much customization, although they all require customization, they all require work to make them work on your own particular needs. And with that, I'd like to say thank you.